Welcome to Scanner School. My name is Phil Lichtenberger, and today we are talking about how to safely buy and sell radios online. It's coming up right now on both our podcast and our video cast. So how you doing again? My name is Phil Lichtenberger, and we are here today to give you a couple of safety tips on buying and selling used scanners online. And it's one of these things that if we're in the market for something that we had, you know, we couldn't afford many years ago, or maybe it's a scanner that we once had that we've unfortunately parted ways with. Maybe there's something that you had as a kid. Maybe there's something that you had maybe 20 years ago, and it's something that you wanted to get back again, or maybe you're replacing some old equipment, or maybe now you're in part of the hobby that you are just in the collector phase and you just want to Put all these little things up on a shelf and just admire what it was that you couldn't get. And again, maybe you're looking to upgrade. Maybe you're looking to go from a radio that is analog into something that is digital and maybe something that will work in simulcast. These are all examples as to why you would want to buy and sell radios online. And of course, one of the things we have to make sure that we are very cautious about and something that we are very aware of is how to be safe. Now, one of the ways that most people buy and sell radios online is via eBay. And eBay is by far the most popular way to exchange goods and services on the internet, right? So whether it be with scanners or anything else, right? Car parts, collectibles, antiques, or whatever, right? eBay is really where it's at. So what we're talking about today goes well far and beyond just eBay. You can take this stuff through Facebook Marketplace, Radio Reference Classifieds, Craigslist, right? Anything that you are going to put a post on there and look for the equipment that you want to buy. So one of the things that we really need to take a look at right away is how to create a good listing when putting something for sale online. And one of the things we need to be aware of is the fact that the title is going to draw your potential customer in, right? The potential buyer. So how do we get somebody's attention? Well, it all starts basically with using a very good and descriptive title, okay? That's one of the key elements we need to have here. And it's very important to be precise. We don't want to say digital scanner, vintage scanner, radio scanner, because the issue is this isn't descriptive at all when somebody is searching for a SDS 200 or a Realistic Pro 2004, right? Because if you're looking for a Uniden 200 XLT, you're going to put the search term in 200 XLT. You're not going to put 1990s handheld scanner. That's not really a good description. So that's why it's important, right? Whistler TRX-1 with boxes and accessories. The more that you can put into that title to differentiate yourself amongst the crowd, that is better. Even something that, you know, I don't know, GRE PSR 800 with Whistler upgrade, with DMR, a unit in SDS 200 with DMR and NXDN and Pro Voice. All that in the title will help separate yourselves from all of the other titles or all the other listings that have the same base model, right? You want somebody to come and realize what they're going to get. The next thing you want to do is when you go down even further in there is you have to write a good detailed description. And that is our second point here when it comes to creating a good listing online is be detailed when it comes to the item you are selling, right? What does this mean? This means that don't be afraid of listing out any defects you may have or anything that's included or anything that might be missing. And it's very important when it comes to eBay to do this because if your item doesn't match the description, a buyer has every right to ask for a refund on that item. So be descriptive. Keypad worn from normal wear and tear. 
is something you can do in there. Missing yellow battery holder. Includes aftermarket antenna instead of stock antenna. Again, these are all things that should be included in there. Another thing you may want to do and you may want to think about is documenting with pictures. It's always been said, right? A picture speaks a thousand words. And that is what we really need to do here when it comes to putting our listings online. So the more pictures, the better. Again, very important to show wear and tear, any scratches. Show the display. Show the display on that the backlight is working. And we're talking about pictures of the front, the back, the sides, the keypad, the knobs, the antenna ports, battery compartments, right? Think of this as an insurance policy, basically, because if something, you know, shows up and it's not the same as when it left your possession, you're going to want to be able to say to eBay, no, 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 this, this doesn't match how it left my hands. Even the serial number tag, right? It, that'd be very important to have on the eBay listing because there are people out there that may think that, well, you know, I got burnt on an, on a, on a sale or I have a piece of equipment here that no longer works and I'm going to harvest out that missing component. I'm going to swap the screen. I'm going to pull the keypad apart. I'm going to pull the knobs off and, and put the broken knob on yours or, you know, the bad dial. I mean, there are some shady people out there and the more photos that you have that show what the item looks like can really build your case when it comes to eBay. Another thing you want to do possibly is put a video together. Show that the radio is working, that it is receiving, that it is scanning, that the backlight functions, that the keys beep, right? That the, the, the speaker works. This can be not only important as a insurance policy, but think about it from the buyer's perspective, right? Wouldn't you feel better buying something if you can see it working? That the, the, the seller is willing to put more information online to show that, hey, you know, you got a good product here. There's been times where I've bought radios and it looks like they work out of the box, but then you find out that they're off frequency. Yeah, that kind of really stings just a little bit. Now, when it comes to shipping and selling, again, you want to make sure that you've packed your equipment very well. And the reason why we're saying that we want to pack the equipment well is because, again, if something happens during transit and and it's not it's survivable, right? Who's on the hook here? The seller is on the hook if something breaks while in transit. So again, it is extremely important to make sure that you've got things packed with bubble wrap, plenty of newspaper or packing materials, air packets, whatever else. And again, if you feel that it's better to document how well you've packed something, again, take pictures of that as well. Again, this is not to scare you into selling on eBay, okay? Take this as advice. I've sold on eBay for years, and knock on wood, I've been okay selling on eBay. But there are people out there that are looking to pull a fast one and are looking to rip people off. And the thing with eBay is they kind of look out for the, for the buyers. They know they have plenty of sellers on there. So... The more that you can put in your pocket that says, I did the right thing, and you can show this to eBay, build your case. That's what you're looking for, right? This is a CYA mentality. Cover your keister, basically, is what we're looking to do. So let's turn things around here. What if we are now looking to buy on eBay? What are some of the things that we may be looking to do? Now, again, the slide says buy on eBay, but... A lot of these are specific to eBay, but we can kind of transfer them over to, say, the radio reference classifieds or even Facebook Marketplace, right? So when it comes to eBay, let's take a look at the seller's ratings and reviews. We can always click on a user and we can see how much feedback that feedback they have. Are they brand new to sell? Do they have a dozen feedback? There's no feedback. 300, 1,000 feedback, right? The more feedback and the higher the ranking is of that user, the more trustworthy they are. The more it should be that they do a lot of business on eBay. They know how to 
pack things, sell things, list things. They are trustworthy, right? This is important. Now, do they normally sell scanners? That's something else we need to look at because are they just going through there and, you know, looking at making a quick buck, basically, right? What I'm saying is, are they into selling storage units, estate sales, or something like that, right? Because if they are into selling mass quantities of goods, maybe they don't realize what they have on hand. They're not able to test the radio. They're not able to turn it on. They should be able to tell you that the radio works. If somebody is selling nothing but electronic gear, you would think that they are smart enough to understand how to market electronic gear. But if they're selling blankets and tchotchkes and wall art and, you know, nonsense, wicker baskets, they're obviously just cleaning things out, right? So again, what we're looking at, we're buying on eBay. We're looking at also what, how much, right, does this item go for? That's important because think about it this way. You're on a bidding site and things can get inflated because people want to buy things, right? What's the lowest and highest that this item is being sold for? And take that as a barometer, right? You know somebody got a steal when they got it for the lowest price. You know somebody got into a bidding war when they went to the highest price. Or maybe the highest price came with the original box and the original packing material and was never used and is new old stock and was something that somebody found in the back of a closet, Right? But very important, too, when we look at buying on eBay is when we look at all of the, the, the completed listings, how many listings have been completed, which means that the auction is over, but how many have actually sold? That's an important thing here to look at because you can have a 1,000 items on eBay that have been completed listing. In other words, their timer expired. They've been listed for a week or two weeks or a month. But if only 10% of them sold, that shows you that there's really not much of a market for this item. And maybe you'd be better off with different types of auctions. And we have several different types of auctions that we can look at on eBay. What kind of auctions can we look at here? Well, we have what's called a normal bidding auction. And a normal bidding auction basically means is that you and other people are bidding against each other to win the item. Now, again, this can be a little bit dangerous because you get heated. You get passionate. You end up getting emotional because you just want to win that item. Maybe you don't. Maybe you have, you know, some restraint and you know what this item is worth. And you say, well, I'm not going to go past $100. That's my max bid. And you put your max bid in there. And somebody else then says, no, I need it for $101. No, they're not bidding $101. They're bidding maybe $130, but the max amount to bid to beat your $100 is $101. That's important to know. And there's people out there that will go, oh, it's $101. Let me put in $102. And they get on their keyboard and they pop in $102. What happens? Well, the person with $130 auto bids now to $103. And somebody now is bidding against and driving up the cost of the item. Not because they're bidding one at a time, but because the end user put $130 in and that's the max they're allowed to go to, right? Without really intervening. Some people just need to see how high that ceiling is and they will go in there and just keep running and running and running it up. So instead of saying, well, I want to do 110 and then the auction goes to 111, they keep creeping it up. And before you know it now, Everything's inflated on here. So that's a normal bidding, and that's why those are kind of dangerous. Another type of bidding that you can do is called a buy it now. And that is when the seller has listed an item for sale that they know that they want to buy or sell it at. Now, I'm a Unication dealer. I own East Coast Pagers, and I, well, at the time of this recording, and it remains to be seen if I keep my eBay store, But I have items up there that are buy it now. And what buy it now basically means is I'm not going to allow you to bid on this item. If you want it, it's going to be this price. Basically, you've turned eBay into an online listing for a goods sold at a particular price. This is important to know. But there is also a third type 
that we should look out for. And this is called make an offer. And what make an offer basically means is the fact that it can be an auction, it can be buy it now, but as a seller, you're willing to entertain a lower price than what it is listed for or what I would typically take for it. So for example, if a bid is at $10 and you know that the radio is worth 115 right? You're willing to take $100 for it. Somebody can make an offer for $100 and you can accept that offer. You can also set your ad up so that it can automatically offer it. For example, if you have an item that you have to sell for a minimum advertised price of say $200, but you can actually sell it lower than that for floor, you might be able to accept an offer anything between floor and your asking price. That's just an example of something like that. So we have several different ways that you can buy and sell on eBay. Again, some of this stuff transfers very well over to other platforms. And we're gonna talk about those other platforms right after this break. Now. Again, anybody who is a Patreon supporter at the $3 or higher level doesn't get this following break on the podcast version of this videocast or podcast because, again, we are simulcasting this right now. So for everybody else, we will catch you all in just a moment. All right, so we've spent the first half of this podcast and videocast talking about eBay, right? Because that's basically the world's largest marketplace when it comes to stuff like this for buying and selling used gear. But let's talk about other locations to buy and sell used gear. And we have, especially for the scanner radio market, right? We're going to make sure we, we focus on that. So there's local market, right? Trading, in-person, stuff like that, right? Ham fest, swap meets, flea markets, those kinds of things. You also have Craigslist. Craigslist, I've done plenty of business on Craigslist as well. A little bit more like the wild, wild west, I guess. But again, it's the earlier version of Facebook Marketplace. The only thing I don't like about Craigslist is the fact that you can't vet anybody. You can't go on their their Facebook profile and see the kind of person they are or what else they actually have listed. You can't see any feedback or something like that, right? When it comes to looking at maybe the radio reference forums, where if you're going to buy off of the radio reference classifieds, you can look at the person who has been posting and see their forum posts or look at their feedback and see, you know, what type of person this is. And it all comes down in the end to payments, 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 payments. How can we be safe with our money? And that is now going to be what we're going to talk about now, how to safely pay and receive money for selling items online. This is, again, a very important thing here we have to talk about. So we have a lot of different ways we can do this. We can do PayPal. We can do cash if in person. We can do PayPal friends and family. We can do Facebook payments. We could do Venmo, Zelle, money order, bank check, right? Other wire services. Let's go through these right now because this is very, very important right here. I highly recommend that if you're doing any types of transactions online, you don't use anything other than standard PayPal payments. Don't use friends and family. Here's why. Friends and family has no buyers or sellers protection. It basically means I am paying somebody that I know for a transaction so that I can pay them the money that I've borrowed from them. That's kind of what this is for. Friends and family basically means there's no PayPal fees on there. This is why people like to use friends and family for goods and services, which is in violation, by the way, of PayPal's terms and services. So if you're buying a, or selling a scanner, you, know, you shouldn't be using friends and family, okay? What happens if you use friends and family and the buyer says they never got the scanner or the seller never ships the item they're supposed to sell? What happens? You can't go back to PayPal and say, hey, this guy didn't give me what he was supposed to give me. PayPal's going to turn around and say, you use friends and family. You know the person. Go figure it out on your own. If you use standard PayPal, they will actually give you 45 days to dispute the transaction. 
And what basically is going to have to happen is the person who is shipping the good is going to have to provide with a tracking number. And that tracking number then will be submitted in as part of the claim. And if PayPal says, well, the tracking number is showing that it was delivered, guess what? Now the, the person receiving the package has to figure out, okay, well, where did it go? Or they'll say, here is my tracking number. It looks like it got lost in the mail. Then the buyer is then on the hook down to file a claim and get his money back. But if the, if the seller can't produce a tracking number, what happens then? PayPal should step in and say, well, obviously the person who was supposed to be shipping the unit never shipped the unit. So we're going to settle with the person receiving the unit, the buyer, and the buyer should get their money back. This is why it's very important to use standard PayPal payments. Let's talk about some other ones that are very popular that also fall into this friends and family transaction category. Facebook payments. There's no protection with Facebook payments because that's meant, again, to pay for lunch, dinner, movie tickets, those kinds of things that if somebody that you know, because again, you're on Facebook, so you must know the person, you are going to give them money for a, you know, something that maybe you need to pay your way, your half, your third, your portion of, right? Same goes true for Venmo and Zelle because Venmo and Zelle is more or less a money wire transfer. So we want to stay away from those money wire transfer services. I would stay away from bank checks because if somebody were to give me a bank check and it bounces after I've already shipped something, guess what? Not only am I out the item, but I'm out 25 bucks because the bank charged me for the bounce check. And under no circumstances while we're talking about bank checks here, should you ever receive a bank check that is for more than the item you are selling? Do not send money back to the person buying the stuff. They may say, oh, well, give me a gift card for 25 bucks. We'll call it even. Or just give me a check. Or just put cash in an envelope when you sell me the item and we'll call it even. No, that's a huge red flag that there's something not right here. This means that the person that is basically paying you, gave you a phony check, and they want cash back, which means now they've got your cash. No good. No bueno. Do not do it. So to summarize this right here, this means that the only good that we want to have for payment is PayPal, or again, cash, if we're doing this in front of a person-to-person -person transaction, because cash is king. In the bad pile, we've got PayPal friends and family, Facebook payments, Venmo, Zelle, bank checks, money orders, or other wire transfer services. All right, so the next thing we want to look out for when being safe when buying and selling online are trades. Trades can be a very, very unique situation here because really you are taking somebody else for you know being an honest person. Deal at your own risk here. So a couple of weeks ago, we talked with Clayton from Moore Park Scanner and he was able to trade his way up from a BCD996 into an SDS. I think that's the way he went with it. Or a 536. That's how he went. He went from a 996 to a 536. And it ended up being basically that, you know, he wanted to upgrade and the person with the 536 had a hard time seeing the screen. So it was really a win-win for the two of them. Clayton tells a story on how he vetted the person that he was trading with. He went on to radio reference because that's where the deal was brokered. And he went through the person's uh, posting history and saw that they were very active for years on radio reference. The guy's been around and based off of Clayton's research, he felt very comfortable doing the deal with the person that he was going to be dealing with. Now, hopefully the other person felt just as comfortable and did the same amount of research, but trades can be very scary. And I've seen this go down all over the place, especially on two way radio groups and even on car parts. People will say, I'll exchange this for that. You ship, I ship. They both exchange tracking numbers. And guess what? Some person gave bogus tracking information or didn't ship or shipped a box full of bricks. And now they've got what they wanted and you got a box of bricks or you got nothing at all. Trades can be very risky. How do we work around a risky trade? Well, you could do something like this. Look, we agree that the value of this is cover my losses here. $200, $300, 
I'll send you a PayPal for $200. You send me a PayPal for $200. If your item doesn't show up, I'm going to open up a claim with PayPal. If our items do show up, we've both wired each other $200. That means we kind of broke even here. To me, that's a good way to do a trade. Be safe. Think about the outcome as to what would, what would, what would the bad outcome be and how would you want to protect yourself. These are all things that we need to, we need to look out for. All right, we're getting close now. We've, we've found an item. We've paid for the item. We've vetted the person that we are buying from or selling to, right? We have an item. We're, we've listed it. We have a buyer. What's next? Well, we have to get it to the buyer. And in order to do that, we have to ship it. Now, shipping can be one of these forgotten fees when it comes to dealing with selling things online. And a lot of times I have seen listings online where shipping is like $25, $50. Well, I think eBay's putting the end to that. But they're, they're these inflated shipping costs. You've got to remember when you're dealing online and you're dealing with buying something, you have to add into the amount of money it's going to cost to ship to your door. Sometimes it's not worth it. I've seen it plenty of times where I know I can ship that item for under $10 all day long because I ship all day long. I Well, I don't ship all day long, but I ship every day. Let's put it that way. I know the value of whatever it is that it's going to cost to go from point A to point B. When I see something for $25, I have to ask myself, why is this $25? Well, typically a person probably put something in a box and brought it to UPS and that's what UPS said it was going to cost. Here's the deal. How do you figure your shipping costs? One trip... I have for you basically is to look at USPS regional rate shipping. Now, again, this is only available in the United States here, but this can typically be cheaper than priority mail because priority mail, if it fits, it ships and up to 75 pounds, but you're paying for that high rate of not having to think about what it is that you're shipping. Basically regional rate shipping boxes are an online only shipping option for you. Now it doesn't mean that you can only ship online. This basically means you have to order the box online and have it sent to you. And then you have to pay for your shipping online through USPS. You can't just go to the counter and drop it off. You can't get regional shipping rates through the counter. This can be a lot, a lot simpler to do. Now, another option here is you can brown box and ship priority mail. That can be sh cheaper too. But the cheapest way to really ship is UP USPS first class mail. As long as your shipment is under a pound, you should be able to go and ship via USPS. Now, make sure that you've packed your item well. Again, we talked about this before, right? Pack it up, put it, put all the packing materials in there, whether it be packing materials, bubble wrap, styrofoam, newspaper, whatever it is. Put the item in a box, weigh the box. Again, Scales are really cheap. You can find them all over Amazon and they're, and they're cheap. You've got your weight. You've got your dimensions. You should be able to go onto UPS's website or your local carrier, whether it be USPS, Canadian Post, wherever it is you're listening. And you should be able to get an online rate for whatever it is you're shipping. If you're on eBay, you can list the weight and the dimensions of the box and eBay will calculate the true fees to ship an item to a customer. So, that's a good way of figuring out what the fees should be for an item if you are listing it online. Because again, you don't want to lose a sale because you've, you're going to just assume $25 to ship. Now, there's one more fee that we need to watch out for. These are our eBay sellers and PayPal payment fees. eBay is going to take a cut. eBay wants to take a cut because you've used their platform. PayPal is going to take a cut if you're not using friends and family because you're using them as a brokerage service. So you have to remember that you're going to lose X percent to eBay and X percent to PayPal. And there's calculators you can find if you Google them to find out what my final cost is going to be. If I sell an item for X dollars, what my out of pocket is going to be at the end of that. Again, you can also put your purchased amount in there too, and you can actually find out your profit or loss if you do that as well. So let's go through things really quick here and summarize what we've talked about today. So eBay can be a great place to buy and sell scanners. Other options include Facebook Marketplace, Radio Reference Classifieds, and your local swap meets. 
Make sure you use PayPal. Don't use friends and family. Don't use checks. Don't use Venmo or anything else. Use something that's going to give you something that you can go back on. Estimate your shipping costs before you list. And also, don't forget about hidden fees. And most importantly, don't be afraid to walk away from a deal if it doesn't sound good. Because again, you don't want to get burnt. And if something doesn't smell right, it probably isn't right. So once again, thank you for listening to our podcast and watching us on YouTube today on our videocast. Make sure you are subscribed so you can catch our next podcast and videocast release. My name is Phil Lichtenberger, and this is Scanner School, where we teach you everything to know about the scanner radio hobby. 73.